Hi folks, Eli here. So today we're gonna to talk about five skills that will be essential for you in any front-end web developer career. I'm gonna talk from my own experience. This is what I do the most, it's what I love the most. So I'm gonna give you my top five skills to start working on if you wanna be a better web developer or break into the space. For the first of our topics, we're gonna to talk about form validation and input sanitization. This is a common one. It's a little more of the boring side of front-end stuff, but it's also a vitally important one for security and also for good consistent, easy to navigate websites that take in different information or user data, which is really common. Almost all apps are gonna take in some, are gonna have some kind of interactable form piece to them. So we wanna make sure that we're able to do that in a way that is consistent and clean and helpful for users. So when we're talking about that, the first thing we're gonna talk about is sanitizing an input. So sanitizing an input is a very simple concept, it's essentially just the fact that we don't wanna take anything a user gives us in a form and send it to a database or to any kind of other storage or to manipulate it or show it or render it unless we've done some form of sanitization on it, which essentially just means making sure that there is no executable code in that input. It's a common security practice. It's really important to avoid passing that stuff directly in because otherwise people can run do things like SQL injection where they run SQL on your database via a user input form on a website or they can do things like cross-site scripting where they're taking over the control or dynamic behavior of a site based on adding a link or some kind of executable behavior into something that's being repurposed by your application. So it could cause then it to redirect them to somewhere else or they could be, then be infected with malware and it looks like your site's the one that did it to them. So sanitization is very important. The next thing I would really focus on is form validation. Form validation is super important to anything. We wanna make sure that when someone gives us an input that we're actually checking to make sure that's the kind of input we're looking for. There's this common expression in data engineering, which is garbage in, garbage out. Uh, that is really common in the tech world that we're taking in bad data all the time. So the best way to do that is to do some kind of validation on what you're taking in, make sure it's the, the right type of data coming in, as well as it's also in the right structure or format, however we want it to be. Um, so validation and having powerful validation can be a really impactful thing for any kind of front end UI. So the second major skill we're gonna discuss is testing both on the end to end and component level. Testing is two different levels on the front end side. One is end-to-end -end testing or E-to-E -E testing as it's often known, or then there's another one called component-based testing. So end-to-end -end testing is typically done, I, for me, I've done it with Cypress. That's been, it's a new tool that's out. It helps actually bring in both of these. So Cypress and then Jest for the component testing side of things. Uh, Cypress is a browser-based end-to-end -end tester, which is really helpful for the UI because it allows you to actually perform click actions, navigate through different fields, forms and behavior and make sure that everything's acting the way you want. Make sure things are loading correctly, rendering correctly, are all your images loading properly? Do you have a broken link somewhere? So you can program all those things into a Cypress test suite. They're even working on adding tools for optimization and things like that as well to get a better, better idea of some of the things we'll talk about later on in this video. On the component testing side of things, component testing is usually fairly granular and it's tied to reusable components. So when you have a reusable component, you wanna make sure that you're testing a bunch of different parameters that can be passed into it and make sure it's still rendering correctly, there's no errors that are happening and that your website is still there. Now the reason that I have testing on this list, even though it's not specifically a front end skill is because testing, if you are the only front end engineer working on a project, if you're building a personal project or you're working for a small company, is one of those things that at least I used to overlook a lot. And I actually had the experience of starting with what was supposed to be a very small site where the scope crept up to the, the point where it's like above 50 pages. And that site is now impossible to manually test. And so I'm now going back through and working through the technical debt of adding test IDs to, across all of my different components, making sure that everything can be queried correctly by Cypress as it's doing its end-to-end -end testing all the way through. And it's a really helpful thing to think about starting that process at the beginning and learning a little bit as you start out on a project rather than waiting until you're at the end and all the technical debt has already been accrued and you have to then work your way back through a whole code base trying to figure out how you're gonna test things, even especially if you don't remember how they're gonna work anymore, which is gonna be a big issue for a lot of people. The third skill we're gonna talk about right now is app performance and how that impacts search engine optimization and how you can best improve your app's performance. So this one is the one that kind of gets thrown at a lot of people um, even though we don't realize it as kind of the common thing to look at after a boot camp or after graduating college, it's a common tested thing. So essentially what is the performance or the performance or how performant is your web page or web app that you're building? There's a bunch of different things that go into this. I don't have time to cover this broad of an issue in real depth in this video, but just to kind of give you an overview, there's a couple of different things we're gonna think about to try and make our websites more performant. So one is figuring out how to optimize and minimize the number of queries 
that we are going through. You wanna try and figure out ways to bring data in and then not have to bring it back in every time something changes in the state of that page. So bringing it in, storing it in the state, so we're not then constantly going through the process of recalling that same method over and over again to get something from the, the server. Because essentially that is one of the big things that'll slow down your load speed. And it's important to know that your page performance is heavily tied to how well optimized your page is gonna be for search and a couple other things. There's a really powerful tool called Lighthouse that's built into your Chrome developer tools that will help you a ton and can profile your site in order to help you understand where you're kind of lacking in terms of how your, your page performance is running. Another thing that's really important to understand in that same vein is a thing called memoization. Memoization is essentially just a fancy term for if we have a method where none of the input values have changed, we don't wanna run that method again each time the UI is rendered. If you're in the example of like a React where it's gonna be re rendered anytime there's a state change. So memoization can be done in React. We do it with use callback and that allows us to essentially avoid rerunning that method unless any of the input values for that method have changed. And so that's a huge thing for ongoing dynamic pages and their efficiency as they operate and run because it's avoiding a big chunk of the work that's being done to render the content on the page when it's rehydrated or when something changes in state. It allows you, your page to operate in a more efficient, easy manner. Other things to think about within the space of when we're calling an API is making sure we're not pulling back a ton of data all at once. If we have a ton of data coming into the page all at once, it's gonna take it a long time to be sent over the wire. So we wanna make sure that we're trying to minimize that size. If you have a huge amount of data being rendered on a page, try and figure out a way to paginate the data, either in your calls and your requests, or even just how it's displayed. That way you're only making the call for the exact data set you're gonna be rendering instead of grabbing the whole data set and manipulating it on the front end. That is in general going to really slow down your page performance in a big way, and thus lower your total search engine optimization and also just the user experience of your page, which is really important as well. The last piece inside the API front is also making really good use of API queries. So adding different query variables and parameters to the end of your request to an API or service, if it supports it, can be a huge help in terms of a lot of this. Uh, I know for me, the CMS that I use, Strapi, is allows for a ton of built-in behavior on query parameters that allow me to re retrieve a lot of the data I need. It has pagination built in. It has a lot of different queries that I can query any given field on a data type that I've created just through the query parameters and the route of the API call that I'm making. Our fourth skill today is talking about workers and multi-threading and how that can impact your site's load speeds and also improve your site's search engine optimization. Just to introduce, threads are a concept that's a little more advanced and doesn't get covered in a lot of boot camps, but if you went through an undergraduate program, you may have heard a little bit more about these. Threads are essentially parallel processes that are being operated on two different CPU cores, which is a bit of a simplification of how multi modern multi-threading works. But as far as we need to be considered, essentially there's two different pieces of the computer doing two different things simultaneously instead of doing them sequentially. And that can be a big thing in the front end world uh, via a tool called a worker. So in JavaScript, we don't have a ton of multi-threading performance that can be added at least out of the box. So what we use instead are things called workers. Workers are essentially a single background thread that is not tied to UI code execution. So a, a good example of it is I built a very complex dashboard a while back. That dashboard brings in tons and tons of data, needs to aggregate it into a series of graphs that all require the data format to be set up in different ways. And so instead of doing all that work when I'm executing and first loading my page, which would bring about really slow page performance, what I did instead is I brought it back into a worker. And so the page loads with a couple different loading component, UI components, which is something we'll talk about later on. And then in the background, the worker is doing all that tabulation into the correct object format for these graphs to then render that data in a way that is usable. And what that does is it allows my UI to load and be considered fully loaded by any kind of search engine optimization score before the actual code execution on formatting into those graphs is done. And then the graphs just pop in as those execution methods are finished by the worker. And that's a really helpful thing because it gives the user some initial visual feedback. They know the page is working. And also what it avoids is that dreaded timeout lockdown screen that can pop up at the top of a, of a web page. We've all seen it when it says the page has become unresponsive. That a lot of times is happening because there's too much being done in JavaScript. And so whatever the browser's default timeout setting is, is catching before that JavaScript is finished executing. And then a lot of times users are not gonna have the patience to try and reload the page again or wait for it to continue to load. And so you just aren't even gonna have an experience at that point. So understanding workers, understanding how you can obfuscate and offload a lot of that work into a worker to allow your page to render and then have data populate is a really good skill for any front end developer. Our final skill to talk about is graceful error handling as well as loading screens and loading components to improve user experience on any application you're building. 
The first piece being error handling and graceful failure is a really important one. So first of all, anytime you're doing any kind of dynamic call out to an external source, a data source, an API, whatever it is, you should be putting that in a try catch statement because if that ever returns something other than a 200 status response, we don't want our entire app to go down. We don't want it to throw a default error screen to our user. We really wanna make sure we're handling those errors inside a try catch. So it should be try catch and then finally, or just try catch, making sure that we're capturing that behavior. And so if something does fail, the entire app doesn't break. Instead, we can log an error or we can give the user some kind of external visual that gives us an idea of what's going on. That also brings us to a, a great thing, which is the error screen. So a lot of websites you'll see if they have an error, they'll either have like, for instance, Amazon has their dogs, their infamous dog pages, where if you find a broken page on Amazon, it just takes you to a picture of a dog and it says, oops, take me back home and then it takes you back to the home page and you can kind of keep going from there. Those are a really good example of something like that. You can also have an overlay piece where you can still see part of the web page in the background no matter what it's doing, but then it says, you know, that we've experienced an error, take me home, try to refresh. Um, or you can even do it at the component level where you shrink the error window down to just the size of whatever block of code is broken. So maybe it's a, if you're building a dashboard, you don't want all the graphs to be unavailable if one is having an issue with its data source. And so instead, you just put that error window just on that component itself. So if that graph is broken, it displays a little under construction logo, and then the rest of your graphs are still working correctly, giving the user a little bit of input that, oh, there's something's going on here, but everything else is still working, and I can see that it's, it's segmented down to that level, so I can still trust the data in these other places. Those are all really helpful things. The other and last and most important thing I can emphasize for people is add some kind of skeleton loader to your pages, especially if they're the kind of page that's bringing in a lot of assets like images or a lot of data. You wanna make sure you're giving the user some kind of visual feedback when they first land on the page that things are going to populate, that things are gonna come forward. So I use Material UI for a lot of my front-end development work. They build in a very handy skeleton loader with that application or with that library. I really encourage people Take a look at that, see how it works. It's very easy in React. You just kind of essentially wait. You can do a ternary expression with the question mark and then wait for the data to populate. When it isn't populated, it shows the skeleton loader. Once it populates, the ternary expression executes to true or false, which then loads the alternate, which is the component that you wanna show. So that can be a really helpful skill as well. These will all bring the web apps you build up and allow you to demonstrate your skills in a better way and also just build more polished experiences that your customers will enjoy using more or your users will enjoy using more. And so that's gonna make everything that we do a little bit easier. They're also really good skills to master because they are kind of universal skills that aren't tied to any one framework or technology. None of them are probably going away anytime soon. And so I really encourage you, if you're trying to figure out coming out of a boot camp or coming out of undergrad or trying to figure out how to pivot more into the front end side of the field, to take a look at these skills, do some practice. And yeah, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll get to them as soon as I can. And otherwise, see you soon.